the very first thing that we should do is go into our preferences and edit them to make sure that we are working in the most efficient manner as possible. I can get into these preferences by hitting either Control K on my keyboard or I can go up to the edit menu, choose preferences, and choose general. If you notice that you forget keyboard commands rather quickly, whenever you go into one of these menus, you'll see not only the name of the command, but the keyboard shortcut is listed to the right if one exists. Under the general command, we're going to go through each of these individual preferences, though we most likely will not be making changes on all of them. Some of these are important to change, some of these are personal preferences, I'm going to present all of mine and allow you to make the choices on your own. I tend to leave things completely alone on the general toolbar here, though you may want to change the HUD color picker to something that works best for you. The strip is what you see right here in the color palette. If you like a larger color selection interface, you may want to choose the wheel. Basically find the one that works best for you. Under the Interface tab, here you can change the color of the windows and background for you. It's my recommendation that you stick with the standard darker gray because it's the most neutral that distracts the least from the actual work that you're creating. I like having show channels and color on. It just helps as a quick visual reference to where you are once we get to learning about channels. Now move to the Workspace tab you can choose to auto collapse iconic panels which again are these palette panels on the right whereas they only stay open if you have your mouse over them it's not something i like because i jump back and forth somewhat though that command is an opportunity under tools again i am going to turn on zoom with scroll wheel and i'm going to have animated zoom and flick panning off these are personal preferences I think they're just graphic whiz-bangs that we don't need that slow us down. Under history log, we can leave that alone, though if you're ever doing collaborative work and you want a backlog of what was done, you can enable this and it will record every single command you do in process to a separate file so you can go back and figure out what it was that you've done. File handling, we're generally going to leave alone, though here you can change the duration of time that goes before the program automatically saves a backup copy to a temporary folder. Please keep in mind, while this is a good backups backup, this cannot stand as your only backup option. It is imperative that you save iterative and backup copies as you work. The rest of it we're going to leave alone. Export we're generally going to leave alone. Quick export allows for fast multi-layer editing that can send things out to individualized files. PNG is probably your best option here because of its option for transparency. Under performance this is where you can choose how much memory Photoshop keeps reserved for itself while the software is open. I recommend leaving this something between 70 and 80 percent. Photoshop is one of the more memory heavy programs that you're likely to use, so you're not going to want to have Photoshop and 3D Studio Max and AutoCAD and Illustrator and your web browser playing music and YouTube open all at once. When you're working in Photoshop, do your best to stay just in Photoshop. You can also come in here and change your graphics processor settings. You should be working on a computer that has a discrete standalone graphics card. So if I click here on advanced settings, this should pop open and you want to make sure that the graphics processor to accelerate computation is turned on. It is not likely that we have a 30-bit display, so we can leave this alone. More than anything, this is a check to make sure that this computer will use the graphics card that we have paid for. It's important here that we take our history states and set it to something that's a little more usable. My comfortable number tends to be 60. Under the Scratch Disks tab, this will list all of the physical hard drives that you have within your current computer. 
it's usually a good idea to get your scratch disk off of your C drive, off of the drive that has Windows installed on it. Though, if that is your fastest drive because it's a solid state, go ahead and keep it there. You'll note here that I've enabled a secondary drive as a scratch disk as well. Scratch disks are virtual memory. When you run out of RAM, the computer has to put its thoughts somewhere else. So a scratch disk is going to be that extra memory. It tends to be noticeably slower than standard reserved memory, but note that this will allow you to work on larger files. Under the Cursors tab, this is one that I think is important and mandatory. Your painting cursors and other cursors should be set as you see here. Full-size brush tip with show crosshair and brush tip, and then precise other cursors. For me, this one is non-negotiable. It's important to know that you are aware of where you're going to be painting and editing as you work. Don't allow the oddly shaped cursors to get in your way of your creativity. Transparency and gamut we will leave alone, as we will for units and rulers, though I'm most comfortable setting my rulers to inches. Guides, grids, and slices. We can leave this one alone as well, though here's where you can change your grid color and your guides color if they're interfering with your creative endeavor. Plugins we can leave alone. Type as well we're going to leave alone. 3D is something that we rarely use in the Photoshop world since we're going to be learning more advanced 3D software like SketchUp and 3D Studio Max, though here are some options for you if you choose to edit them. And technology previews, we'll leave alone. This is something that you can play with on your own. 